Welcome back to 10 with Ken. I'm Ken Steele. At this fall's University Fair, we asked a dozen Ontario University presidents and senior administrators how higher ed leaders can nurture a culture of innovation across the entire campus. In the previous two episodes, we've explored six answers to the question, from listening to campus stakeholders, consult, 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 to sharing best practices among colleagues. We've established a center for teaching and learning. We've heard about the importance of trust. Insecurity does not breed courage. And the key role of campus leadership in disarming opposition to change. We can actually be out there like a football blocker. If you missed parts one or two of How to Spark Innovation, please take 10 and check them out now. This week, we look at the final four answers to the question in part three of How to Spark Innovation. Let's take 10 and take stock. 10 with Ken is an almost weekly look at higher ed news, trends, innovations, and bright ideas in and out of the classroom. Brought to you by Eduvation. We've not quite finished the 10 ways college and university leaders can instill a culture of innovation on campus. But the final four answers to the question are in many ways the most significant for senior administrators. There seems to be strong agreement that campus leaders must forge extensive partnerships outside the university. The other things that we're going to have to be able to do in leaders promote strategic partnerships. We're a very partnered institution. With other educational institutions. We're not only within the university sector. Colleges, in our case of universities, indigenous institutes. Non-governmental organizations. And we work with the uh, AGO Art Gallery of Ontario, with the Royal Ontario Museum, the ROM. Partnerships with municipalities and county governments. We do a lot of work with Waterfront Toronto. International organizations with other universities around the world. And we really love that, um, we describe it as porosity, which is a fancy way of saying the sort of integration of town and gown. New ways of en engaging with the community. We have a tremendous responsibility to build the communities in which we're situated. New ways of engaging with the private sector. How can those partnerships enhance the uh, learning experience, the practical experience of students, and support the research agenda of the university. I think innovation is in part driven by external forces and that we have to have those partnerships in order to be able to, to innovate together. We cannot sit in our classrooms, we cannot sit in our offices and expect that whatever we drink or eat is going to make us entrepreneurial what is going to make us think innovatively. It is how we interact with the rest of the world. Of course, what's good for innovation on campus is also good for innovation in the broader world. Universities are social agents, and, uh, and we tend to be social agents for positive change. And that positive change happens because we have these partnerships outside of uh, our own campuses. And I think that's the, really the key to the future, in my view. Sometimes it all comes down to money. Sometimes the resistance or the apparent resistance to innovation is, is not so much that there's ideological resistance to the innovation so much as the, the, the resource capacity to do it and do it well. 95% of the budget goes to established programs and established uh, departments. It's very difficult to change that. You can put money on the table. Create the right kind of space for them. Find new ways of doing things, but also be supportive with the resources to go with it. Grants, course release to give them time. Budget levers are extremely powerful in, in changing things for better and for worse. You need to be careful what you incentivize. They do require a certain level of financial and other kind of resource inputs. It's not cheap. We put in place a million dollar fund for curriculum reform and development special funds to encourage faculty members to, uh, to think beyond perhaps what they've been taught through their own training 10 or 20 years ago. If innovation ultimately has to be left up to the people on your campus, one of the critical things leaders do is select those people. As Jim Collins says in his management bestseller, Good to Great, you need to get the right people on the bus in the right seats. I'm of the view that everything starts with hiring. Every hire you make, it's a great hire, it makes you better. It ensures you 25, 30 years of success. 
Uh, if it's uh, so-so higher, well, you're building a so-so place and that's just not good enough. It starts at the top. The, uh, the president chooses uh, the senior leadership team for status quo for change. And uh, the provost chooses deans for status quo for change. And the deans have conversations internally towards status quo or for change. So that cascades down in, in a way. When you have the opportunity to, to be hiring young faculty members. If you hire the same kind of people, you do the same kinds of things. You need to hire with a broader lens. You need to be willing to take a chance on people that uh, might look differently, think differently, behave differently. We need more women on faculty. We need more indigenous faculty members. We need more faculty members of color. It's, it's not a nice liberal idea to do this because you're nice. Your success depends on it. We're going to take our the strategic funds we have available and we're going to go out and hire 50 new faculty. Are we able to recruit and attract? Uh, are we able to retain and are we able to foster the very best talent from all over the world? It will be the number one defining factor of which university will succeed and which universities will, will fail. Unquestionably, hiring for diversity and innovative thinking is critical to establish an innovation culture on campus. But university leaders face one more challenge that's even greater. Overcoming a thousand years of academic culture that worships excellence and perfectionism. Universities have not had a lot of tolerance for people making mistakes and people doing poorly academically and that I'm going to say is a mistake. We live in an incredibly conservative and, and risk averse culture. Well, we're, we're, we're cautious. The system is stacked against radically creative ideas. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to say I agree. Risk aversion uh, is, is a danger. We have to have a lot more tolerance for failure. Making it comfortable to take risks. And I think that's true uh, for students and for staff and faculty. There has to be an allowance to allow people to try new things, to be willing to take a risk, which is, you know, something that is scary in most cases. So what do you do? Try to lay blame? You don't punish people for running an experiment for the right reasons with all the due diligence, that which for some reason doesn't work. So allowing them to fail, but expecting them to learn the lesson from it. Risk aversion might be the greatest risk that universities run today. How can we shift from risk aversion to a measure of risk taking, in, in intelligent measured risk taking, uh, that will allow us uh, to, do, uh, to do things differently? We need people who are willing to take the risks it takes to do things differently and when you take those risks and do things differently you're going to make mistakes. Because really I think that that's part of being successful in business is the willingness to take risks, the willingness to fail and learn from that and move on. Not just entrepreneurship in a business sense but innovation in the way we think about things and in the, in the way we do things generally. You need to have a lot of room for people making the wrong steps. It's really up to senior leadership to help foster that culture of entrepreneurship and risk-taking and that leads to innovation I truly believe. People who uh, step outside the box will often have huge difficulty at the beginning of the career but if they last 30 years they're the people that invent new ways of thinking about things and new way of doing things. Despite the reputation universities have for being conservative institutions if you sit in a room full of professors and students and staff, it's a room full of people who have ideas about how we could make things better if, if, if we had the opportunity to do it. It's a wide open world. Thanks again for taking 10 with me. Over the past three episodes, we've heard what a dozen university leaders have to tell us about nurturing a culture of innovation on campus. We've heard that it requires engagement and meaningful dialogue with staff and faculty, and a good working relationship between board and senate. That it's crucial to listen to diverse voices across the campus, including students, and around the world. That transparency and trust are crucial if you want people to think creatively or take a chance on innovation. That sharing the pockets of innovation across campus can be a good way to make it contagious. That running interference is a primary responsibility of senior administrators. That strategic partnerships with other institutions, organizations, and private sector companies can bring invaluable perspective and fresh thinking. That if it wants to see innovation, the institution has to put its money where its mouth is. Reallocating significant budget to new initiatives, facilities, and more importantly, new hires that bring new and diverse points of view. 
And finally, we have to overcome a thousand years of risk-averse academic culture to accept that in order for innovation to flourish, there must be some allowance for failure. We haven't exhausted the ways to answer this question, of course. I've broached it in earlier episodes and we'll come back again to it quite soon. Next time, though, we'll continue our coverage from the OOF, as campus leaders predict the major innovations that will impact higher ed in the next 10 years. I think we are entering a very interesting time. So I see an increasing internationalization of our universities. I anticipate we'll see a lot more work integrated learning, a lot more co-op, a lot more internships. I think we'll be increasingly under pressure to demonstrate the value of a university degree, not on inputs, but on outputs. What we describe as STEAM plus D. Indigenous ways of knowing. Remote education through immersive telepresence. To be sure you don't miss it, take a moment now to join more than 13,000 10 with Ken subscribers and followers on any of a dozen platforms. You'll find links to all these channels in an email subscription form on our website, 10withken.com. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you next time. 10 with Ken is a production of Eduvation Inc. Copyright 2017. I'm available for conference keynotes, campus PD events, board retreats, and committee workshops in person or now virtually too. For more information, please visit www.eduvation.guru or 10withken.com.